was it unwise to set hard-won knowledge to parchment? So sneak thieves such as yourself could steal away with it? Perhaps. But unless you're a special kind of fool, you know that I'm already hunting you. So find what wisdom you can in these pages, for the time in which it might serve you is short. Hello, my name is Kate, and I'm gonna tell you about the witch who knew all the demon lord's names and made it to the book cover in D&D. Dasha, also known by the name Natasha the Dark, Lohi, Hura, Witch Queen of Perrinland, the mother of witches, Ishbilge, Vilva, Zabilna, and finally the most known and feared Igvilv. She was an Orthian Archmage from the Greyhawk universe, whose legacy eventually was spread across other universes too, including Fair and Toril. She can be found in lots of old adventures starting from Castle Greyhawk, the Lost Caverns of Tsoikans, Dancing Hut, to new 5 edition adventures and books such as Demonomicon, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and The Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Even though she's from Greyhawk, and I don't have many Greyhawk charities covered, I still decided to cover Tasha as she is an iconic villain in D&D and a major contributor to modern spellbook. So how did she become such a villain and what did she do? Let's figure it out. My adopted mother and mentor Baba Yaga taught me the first incantations of demon summoning when I was but a girl of 10 winters. Though, my first summoning yielded only a mere quasit, today I possess the true names of dozen or more demon lords and can easily bend them to my will. Despite my many centuries of life, I still recall the trepidation, the near terror, if I speak honestly, of my early summonings. Those few souls that have beheld my true form have been witness to the scars that serve as enduring reminders of the ritual gone horribly wrong. Nobody knows where or when Igvil was born. Her parents called her Natasha and raised her until she ended up in the dancing hut of Baba Yaga. In one of the interpretations of Russian folklore, Baba Yaga stole children and those who were proved strong, she taught magical arts or gifted with magical artifacts, and those who were weak, she ate. So probably Tasha was talented enough to become adopted by the old crone and to study dark magic arts. Tasha the Dark also had a sister, Yelena the Fair, which was quite the opposite, yet also adopted by the old crone. Years passed, and Natasha became quite a powerful summoner under the guidance of her mother. She even got to own a laboratory in the hut, which was located in a secret room away from all common areas, which were connected via teleportation doors, as Natasha disliked interruptions during her work or relaxation and wanted to keep away anyone walking into her chambers. Being taught not to trust anyone, Natasha the Dark was a paranoid person and never kept any valuables in the common area of her laboratory. She hid the way to the secret chambers and placed an invisible stalker to guide the entrance, who would attack anyone except for her and Baba Yaga. Even her sister was excluded from the private area, which could be reached only through the hidden stairs. After many years of study, Natasha left Baba Yaga in the late 3rd century and traveled to the city of Lapola in Greyhawk universe and settled nearby. Since it's the first approximate date I managed to dig on Tasha, I use this date as a counting starting point for other dates too. So, based on the Russian stories and folklore, children were forcefully dropped into the forest to go through initiation trials, which would turn child to adult. And usually those trials were done in the remote hut, where the children were subjected to very terrifying things in order to experience some kind of reincarnation. And all these trials later generalized in a baby-stealing Baba Yaga a guardian of the forest and guardian of the gate between the realms of life and death. And if we stick it to our reality, that might mean that Tasha left Baba Yaga at the age of 17 or 18 years old, which means that she was born approximately in 270s. She knew how powerful the knowledge of true names could be in the wrong hands and took on a new name, Hura. For several years she lived researching the city, gaining more knowledge and conducting experiments, while one day she discovered a vault of doubt inside the city of Lapola. 
Hura was particularly interested in one object in the world, a magical lantern, a powerful rectangular artifact with bright inextinguishable flame in the center and three lenses. When used or combined, lenses produce a cone-shaped beam spell of fear, haste, slow, cold, blind and confusion. Pillaging the vault resulted in her exile by villagers, and she was forced to flee to the free city of Greyhawk around 300 by common years. She changed her name again. Being Tasha now, she met Yagik Yarejernia, who was a wizard in his 30s, and he took her as an apprentice and a member of a newly formed company of the Seven, a group of adventurers. Zagig and Tasha became very close and spent lots of years together, either deep diving into research or adventuring. In 318, the Company of Seven disturbed the lair of Dracolish Dragotha while seeking out the lost citadel of Veleros. They managed to find it by accident while hiding from the Dracolich. The company returned with plenty of magical artifacts, including the Tome of Zix, which was taken by Zagig. The tome contained a lot of secrets, including the spell that was able to trap any living creature if the caster knew information about it. Two years later, in 320, using the gold from the looted citadel, Zagig decided to build the castle Greyhawk, full of deep dungeons for his experiments. Tasha helped him with finding the subject. Being well versed with summoning and possessing knowledge of the abyssal layers, she managed to get Lance of Icor, a powerful artifact that would strip any demon lord of powers. She also obtained the true name of the demon prince of deception, Fras Urblu, which gave the pair a great advantage and helped capture him around 367. For 200 years, the demon prince was kept in the dungeons of the castle Greyhawk. Tasha spent countless nights learning from the demon prince about the abyss, demon tricks, their names and their secrets. She saw the potential of Tom of Zeke's spells, and after many years of studying the abyss through the demon lord, she decided to betray Zagik. She probably understood that with her knowledge of true names of demon lords and the imprisonment spells in the tome, she would be capable of capturing and enslaving any demon prince she desired. One day, she stole the tome and abandoned Zagik, running away with the book to Yatel's mountains. She settled in one of them, which was later called Igvil's Horn. She intentionally picked those mountains and the caverns under those mountains, as she learned of a powerful abyssal energy aura there. She summoned Soikanth, a half-breed son of Frazulbru, and bound him to her will with the Tome of Zeke's power, which she renamed later as Demonomicon. For 100 years she collected knowledge in her tome, gathering information on all demon princes and lords. It was said that Igwilf knew Abyss better than any one of them. Becoming confident in her research and talents, she summoned and bound Grast in 460 by common years. For the next eight years she studied him and his secrets before starting to conquer the nearby lands of Perrinland. During this time, she seducted Grust, or maybe he had no choice. They conceived a child, used the evil, and usually mother dies if she gives birth to a cambion. However, she survived, which hints how extra powerful she was. With Grust's help, Igril went on to build an army to control the nation of Perrinland, which she attacked in 480, and claimed as her own domain. When everything was conquered, Grast presented her with fiend Embrace Cape to congratulate on her victory. During her reign and control over Grast, it is said she gave birth to Drelzna. She was not a cambion, so probably Igwilf took someone from Perrinland. Igwilf further and further researched Abyss and its dwellers, creating a vast rift under her base of operations. On one day, the rift reached critical mass and started to grow on its own opening the portal to the other plane. Grass deceived her and told her that the rift could be closed only by the essence of Tsoikans. During the ritual, the half-fiend rebelled and it cost Igwif half of your powers to slay him. However, weakened, she lost the control over the demon prince and Grass stroke on his own. The great battle happened in 1481 and Igwilf came absolutely depleted but victorious. The tremendous amount of energy released when the grass mortal shell was slain, and it jolted use the evil and split him in two into withering old dying man and a horrific abomination. 
When she recovered from the battle, she hid all her artifacts in the caverns and put guardians and traps everywhere while leaving her daughter Drelzna to guard it. It is unknown where Drelzna was cursed by vampirism, but she was not afraid of aging and was locked in the caverns in a half-dormant state until Igvil would return. However, she did not. Fully recovered, Igvil tried to summon and bind Rust again. However, the demon lord was ready. She fell into a trap laid by Grast Majordoma Varin, who whisked her away to the forlorn prisons of Azagrad, Grast's personal lair of the Infernal Abyss. For more than 100 years, Igvil was kept as prisoner in Grast's domain, until 585, when Turney, a former powerful wizard turned to a fiend by Grast, helped her escape. Igvilf escaped grass clutches, returning to the material plane, and with the help of Turney tried to free a powerful artifact called the Crook of Rao from the Isle of the Ape, an unusual demiplane connected to the dungeons of Castle Greyhawk. However, she was stopped by the Circle of Eight, among which were Mordekai, Tanzer, and Rari. Defeated again, Igvilf retreated to her hidden lair on the abyss. Being cautious as never before, she surrounded herself with four Arcanalos guards and traveled to any location only through astral projection. It is also rumored that she convinced the Frost Giant to accept possession by a Kaku demon, whose name she knew and dominated. Igvil guided the demon-possessed giant along her side. She always liked to have servants and companions. Through her lifetime, she possessed quite many. A Quasit named Slitstiff a black clay homunculus carved to look like Igvil, a quasit named Black Comet, an Incubus Gavish, a Lilisu demon named Sachti, five Arcanalos, two Okluk, Lunderbolt, Sambra, Sovashi, and Ryder, two Stigen Lenorms, and Igrik, a Todd Polymorph Quasit. In about 589 by Greyhawk timeline, during her hiding, she used the Turney Iron Flask to capture the Shard of Essence of Demogorgon, which was betrayed by Malcontent and slain by the adventurers subtly guided by the Queen of Succubi. The Shard possessed great power to oppose Igvil's enemies. You know nothing about my past, the wars I won, the enemies I crushed. I've turned the Hoogras on its end so many times, each time is a new beginning. Igvilf knew that someday Demogorgon will be reborn again, and she will be in the top of his list of most wanted enemies. So she decided to do what she did best. She started going through the plains, eventually ending up on Feyweald. She assumed the name of Zabilna, and built her own domain there called Prismere. Over time, the strange essence of Feywell transformed her into Fey, though she still resembled a human. She tricked everyone to be the kind, helping, benevolent Archfey. Even Grast, who had unfinished business with the Witch Queen, believed that Igwilf was hiding somewhere else. On one of the occasions, he sent to Lamias, Nemesatra and Trisian to parley with Zabilna about the witch whereabouts. In around the year of 700, or 4080s by Dale Reckoning, she became convinced that she was safe and Igvil lost her vigilance. The court of hags she surrounded herself with betrayed her and overthrew her rulership of Prismere, and they saw her as a rival. They took control of a powerful artifact created by Igvil and Baba Yaga, Igvil's cauldron, and put the witch into the magical stasis for years. However, she managed to wake up with the help of adventurers later and destroy all her enemies. So, is she a strong character? From the lore perspective, she was an extremely powerful archmage and summoner who knew all the names of demon lords and demon princes, and now she is an archfey with her own domain and unlimited powers there. Theoretically, you could fight her, but with a lot of preparation. From a technical perspective, if we look at her stats at 5th edition, she is an Archfey of challenge rating 20 with more than 200 HP with 3 legendary resistances and with an attack range of 220. And also, there is a dragon creature roaming her palace, so do not expect her to fight alone. And now a bit of DM tips on how to play her. If you introduce her in your campaign, first think of her motives, whether she would plot against old enemies such as Grast, 
or she would pursue some of her archfey dealings. Secondly, if some of the players would like to fight her for some reason, use your range advantage as most of the player's spells are limited to 60 feet range. Lastly, if she is introduced as a helping character in your campaign or as Archfey patron for the Warlock player, then I would definitely try to hint about her dark past to players and try to link it to, to your story. And that's all about Igwil and her story of transformation from a child to Witch Queen to Archfey. And maybe we will see her again in the next adventures where she outlives Baba Yaga and inherits her dancing hut and all of her artifacts. Actually, I'd like to see that. And if you like the lore, please press like and subscribe button and tell me in the comments below who else you would like to hear about. And see you next time.